our church, we'd like to welcome you. And as a first time visitor, you will find the seat pocket in front of you. We have a visitor's brochure. And inside there, we have a visitor's card. We appreciate you just to take and fill that out. And then as you're leaving today, as you're about right in the middle, middle doors there, middle of the vessel, there's a black box that says offerings on it. Please just drop that in there. It just lets us know that you were visiting with us this morning. And then also, for first time visitors on your way out, with, there's a table right there in the center, and we have a coffee mug and some uh, literature that we'd like to pass along to you. And it's just a gift from us to you to say thank you for visiting with us this morning. And uh, last week, uh, I played the wrong video, and Pastor Dean mentioned it, and several of you said, we'd really like to see that video. So I have the correct video up in the center of the I'll tell you about that. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, anyway. Uh, we have a great video, so go ahead and turn that on. during BB 
CBS, we, uh, we promote that as one of the ministries, and then we start, you know, probably in the July, beginning of August, collecting for you know, the church as it is here. And so we did have EPS this year. We started almost a month late here as far as what we were collecting. And then, to my surprise, on Wednesday, between the hurricane, storm, and rain, I went out and we store a lot of the items in the shed because each year when we pack the boxes, you know, each box can't be just full of school supplies. And, you know, we got the high the school supplies, toys, you know, balance. So each year we have items left over and we take the nice big containers and we pack them nicely so they won't get messed up and stuff and put them out in the shed. And we have probably, I don't know, maybe five or six, seven big, you know, containers like this. And anyway, sometime during the summer, a pinhole leak developed in our shed, leaked into one of the boxes, and it was a different type of lid on that particular box. It filled up with water, it was moldy, nasty, disgusting, it was terrible. Needless to say, it messed up all the rest of them because somehow that snow got into the other boxes. And so I had to throw away a lot of stuff that we had ready to go that we knew or thought we had and we didn't realize until Wednesday night. So with that said, though, somebody brought in a bunch of other toys which made up for a lot of those ones we threw away. And, you know, like I said, all things considered, it was awesome. God worked it out, God took care of it. It was great. You know, 261 boxes were going out, so that's a phenomenal number. That's awesome. So thank you for your help. Thank you for all your gifts and giving and helping with that. We received more money than we needed for the shipping, but we also, there's supplies items that we buy, things that even through the year that we purchase so that we're getting ready as the time comes. Because people don't really realize, even if you come to the packing party, we have all the tables set up. We're, my wife and I are working on it throughout the, the, the calendar year, uh, buying certain things, putting certain things together, getting things ready ahead of time. And so anyway, thank you guys, appreciate it. It was really awesome. And as you can see by the videos, the impact that it makes with the gospel around the world. And also, my Smirchins personally, even when COVID was going on, they came, they set up hospitals, they do that in foreign countries. And then also, one of the things that they do too is during the Christmas season, they have where you can go and for like 10 bucks, 20 bucks, or whatever it is, purchase 12 chickens, purchase a goat, purchase, you know, whatever. And they send it to needy families around the world. And they say, you know, for the chickens, it produces X amount of eggs per day, per week, whatever. And so they allow families to be able to provide for themselves even beyond that, and they, you know, drill in wells and stuff. So there's a lot of things that go into the donations and various things that we do through Samaritan's Purse. So it's a wide range uh, ministry, but most importantly, with all that help, it always bringing the gospel to us. So thank you for that. Uh, coming up in just, it's hard to believe that December is going to be here very shortly. And we have a kids' Christmas program, and the kids and I and uh, Diane, we've been practicing over the last handful of weeks, and we continue to practice as leading up to that. And so we're going to have that Christmas program, the Christmas Carol Special Report, and that is going to be on Sunday, December 20th. It'll be in the 10 o'clock service. We're going to just have that day one service. It'll be the 10 o'clock service. It'll be held out in the gym for you know, to take the space and such out there. But the kids will be singing, they'll be smacking, and dressing up, different things like that. So you guys want to see it, you know, bring your friends, people out, and we'll be having that coming, so that'll be on December 20th, something to look forward to. And kids, in just a moment, I'm going to dismiss you, but before that, Pastor Dean is going to come up and do something, and I'll have him dismiss the kids. He's getting old for <laughs> Well, we um, want to recognize our veterans today. Wednesday was Veterans Day. It sort of fell in the middle of the week. We, we, we congratulated them or honored them a little bit on the previous Sunday by recognizing them. But I didn't have anybody stand or have anything for them. I thought, you know, it would be nice this year to do something a little different, to have a little gift for all of our veterans uh, that come to church. So this morning, I have uh, some gift cards and uh, a present from the, the school, a little, a little bag with some goodies in it. Um, this, this is going to be for our oldest veteran that's here today. This is, uh, again, compliments of Grace Christian School, our school ministry. And then we have some gift cards. Uh, 
They're all 10 elegant gardens uh, to dunk. One, one, some are to dunk and dunk, some to the Burger King, uh, some to uh, Subway, and some to Applebee's. I will ask that if you can make up your mind before you come up as to which one you would like. But uh, at this time, what we'd like to do in honor of our vets is first of all, have all of our veterans stand. Right over here, all of our veterans stand up for just a minute. Thank you.
expectation that someday when we pass from this life, we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, at this year, of all years, that certainly brings a certain amount of comfort, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, if we think about uh, all the things that are going on and the uncertainty of life. Well, I have a couple of phrases. You know, it's been an interesting week, interesting year, but an interesting week. Um, not that long ago, we were wondering whether or not Hurricane uh, Ada would come up our way and cause any damage. But fortunately, praise the Lord, I mean, we're, we're not happy that the storm hit uh, some people and, and caused damage in certain countries as well as South Florida and other places. But we are happy that there was very minimal damage here. The, the worst we had were, were some leaks out of the gym, which we've had before. And so as far as we know, nothing, nothing worse than that. So we praise the Lord for that. Also, uh, with COVID, our, our attendance has been about half of what it is usually. This, this year, 2020, it's almost half of what it usually is. But yesterday, we had a pretty decent showing of people that came and helped pack the shoeboxes. And it, it wasn't as many as we've done in past years, but it was over half. It was over half of what we've done. So uh, when you look at attendance versus what we packed, 261 shoeboxes, I think is very good. We also um, had the highest amount of money donated this year to the shoeboxes. Almost six dollars, five dollars short, and I'm not sure. There's probably a five dollar gift that already came in somewhere that maybe hasn't been counted. But the bookkeeper told me we had um, five thousand nine hundred and ninety-five dollars that came in for the shoeboxes. So there's a prank. So less people, more money. Uh, less people, but it's still a good turnout. I mean, these are these are just odd things that the Lord has blessed us with in the midst of some what could be seen as negative things. Also, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, that have been praying for my wife. Uh, many of you know that her ITP has reoccurred, and um, so she went to the doctor who noticed that she had blood blisters in her mouth. Her nose was bleeding. She had bruises, and this is about the sixth or seventh time that it's come back. It's, um, we're getting used to it. But uh, it's been almost three years. So while it came back and some people were saying, oh, you know, uh, so I hope she does well and everything. Uh, on the other hand, this is the longest she's gone in several years without a reoccurring. So we feel blessed, believe it or not, <laughs> that it's been three years. Back three years ago, Christmas. I spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the hospital with her. Um, so she went to the hematologist Monday, her platelet count was 18,000, which anything under 20 is critical, and almost 200,000 to 400,000, something in that ballpark. Uh, we were concerned that they were going to put her in the hospital. I really didn't want that with COVID going on and everything. Um, but because it was 18, and the last time it was 3,000, which is really low, um, they let her go home and they put her on some Promactor, which is what they put her on the last time. That was another concern that we had. Because, um, let me read to you uh, one of the prices for Promacta that I found on the web with, with a good RX coupon, she's on 50 milligrams a day, a 30 day supply, three years ago it was a little over $3,000 a month. Now, we got, fortunately, a grant back then from the pharmaceutical company, so we praised the Lord for that, but I didn't know whether we would be able to get a grant again this year. But um, anyways, it is now, when I looked it up, for the good RX coupon, it is now $9,000, $418.07 for a 30-day supply of 50 milligrams per day. Can you imagine? Who could afford to pay $9,000 a month? And I know there are some medications more expensive than that. However, the hematologist had 90 days of samples. Missionary journeys, 
starting multiple churches. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was once a persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus, was probably the greatest missionary, the greatest evangelist that has ever lived. We know that he started more churches than anybody else that we know of, and those churches existed for a number of years even after his death. Now we've had a lot of modern day evangelists that have won a lot of people to the Lord, but I think I could probably fairly accurately say, without doing a serious study on it, that none of them have started as many as many churches as Paul did that continued on with the Lord for some time. Now, when I say that, I'm not including missionary organizations that may have multiple missionaries, like Gospel for Asia, which has actually thousands of missionaries, or, or some other missionary organizations, but I'm talking about one person. Now, he had companions that traveled with him. We saw that last week, as we saw Paul coming into Philippi, and he has uh, at least Silas with him at this time, but Timothy seems to have stayed in Philippi. So let's read in Acts chapter 17 as we look at Paul's methodology in his evangelism and try to glean some principles from it for our witnessing today. Acts 17, beginning with verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Let's pray. Now, Father, and as we look at, at Paul's missionary journey here, his second missionary journey, and we see um, how he did what he did, and, and we see patterns in what he did as he purposefully, intentionally uh, sought to win people to Christ and establish churches to help us, again, to realize that you've given us the same task that you gave to him. He was not unique in that sense. The Great Commission applies to all of us. We're all going to the world and make disciples, uh, teaching them to be obedient to all the things that Christ taught us and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, uh, Father, help us to glean uh, principles from Paul's a methodology that he uses here and be able to use it in our witness uh, for others as we seek to honor you and help people come to know the Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the first things that I think we can deduce correctly from looking at this passage of this missionary journey is that all seem to concentrate on more major metropolitan areas. He, he, he dealt a lot with, um, or did a lot of ministry and evangelism in bigger cities. We see when he arrives to Macedonia, he first goes to Philippi. Then as he goes from Philippi to Thessalonica, he passes through two smaller towns, both of them about 30 miles apart, and, and yet nothing is said about any ministry in those two towns um, that we read about in verse 1, just that he went through them, that he passed through them. Now, maybe, maybe they didn't have a synagogue, which Paul, that's one of the things that we see Paul doing, is when he would go into a city, he goes into the synagogue. We see it here at the end of verse 1, and we see it in verse 10 when he gets to Berea. Uh, we see it in almost every city that he goes to, he goes into the synagogue. Now, there's probably a very simple explanation for that, that is, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was trained in the Jewish scriptures. He sat under the feet of Gamaliel, one of the best Jewish rabbis of that day, and he knew the word, and he knew it well. He also knew that Jewish people of that day, unlike many Jewish people today, 
believed in the, the Old Testament as being the Word of God, being literally the Word of God, the verbal thing there is expression, whether they use those terms or, uh, um, you know, uh, define it the way that we use today, they believe it was the Word of God. I say unlike today because today a lot of Jewish people are much more liberal in their view of the Old Testament. They see it as, as historical narratives that describe their people and what happened to their people, but they don't necessarily believe it to be the infallible Word of God. I was shocked. I mentioned it before when I went to Israel, and our guy told us that uh, he said about 98% of Israelis are atheistic. I was surprised to hear that. Even though I had spent several uh, months working at a Jewish condominium about a semester when I was in Bible college, and I heard that at a predominantly Jewish occupied condominium in Bell, Bell Harbor, Florida, just between uh, Hollywood and Miami. A really nice condominium. In fact, it was in the 70s. You had to have a little credit card pass to get into the parking lot. It was all gated off, and you put a little credit card in, and the gates would open, and then get down in underneath the parking, it was underneath the condominium. You had to have, you had that credit card again. And I was a, a night security. Not really a guard, but I was a nice security at the place, which was an easy job and a great job for a college student because I could study all night long. I took my books with me and basically I sat around at a table that had a little office there with coffee and stuff and just studied. And we very seldom had any problems. I mean, they were predominantly retired Jewish people, what kind of probably, right? And very little problems. And help them bring their groceries in or something like that. The only time we had problems was when the grandkids came. <laughs> right? Over the holidays or over summer, the grandkids would come, and then we'd have, a, we had a game room there with a pool table and some other things, and we had a swimming pool, and the, the teenagers a lot of times would begin to get a little, you know, uh, restless and cause some problems, and I'd have to go in and ask them to be quiet or calm down or, or you know, call their uh, grandparents and ask their grandparents to intervene. Otherwise, it was pretty simple. But because of that, because, because I, I, I had so much time, I got to meet a lot of these um, Jewish occupants of this condominium, and I would try to share Christ with them. And I was surprised as a naive uh, second semester Bible college student to discover how many of them didn't believe the Old Testament. I would take them to the Old Testament and start reading it, and yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't believe it. They believed that it was historical. That it recorded actual events that happened, but as far as it being in battle, no, it was just like a history book. And, and I was sort of shocked. That's the way it may be today, that wasn't the way it was in Paul's day. And so Paul goes into the synagogues purposefully because he knows that he can start with that which he knows best and, and that which reveals to Christ. Because remember, they didn't have a New Testament, right? There was no New Testament at this point in time. The New Testament was just being written. There might have been the Gospel of Mark at this time, or, or maybe um, I, I had to look at the exact chronology of the dates, but there would be um, very little to any New Testament. And so when Paul went into witness, he would witness from the Old Testament, which is what the Jewish people of his day believed in anyways. And so that's why we see him going into the synagogue so frequently, because there's a starting point. There's a, there's a common ground that they can agree upon, and it's the scriptures that bring about the new birth anyways. Right? We were born not of corruptible seed, the Bible says, but of incorruptible seed by the living and enduring word of God. People are saved through the word, not through our logic, not through our apologetics, not through our reasoning, but through the word of God. They hear the word, and the word mixed with the Holy Spirit's convicting power and with faith causes belief. And uh, so Paul goes to these major cities where there are synagogues. By the way, uh, Philippi leads to Thessalonica. From Thessalonica, he went down south to Corinth and, and then to Athens. That's what's called the Ignatian Way. It's a, it was a common trade route. So that also explains why Paul might have taken that route, because there are a lot of people um, that would be more likely to find food, more likely to find maybe a guest house here or there, if you had to stay somewhere. It's sort of like taking I-75 versus 41, right? There's a few old hotels on 41, if you take 41 north out of Florida. Um, but there's a lot more on I-75. So Paul took the I-75 corridor uh, from Philippi <laughs> down uh, to Athens eventually. And along the way, stopped in the big cities. Now, why stop in the big cities? 
Wait, wait. You know, we live in Hudson Square, and many of us, I don't, I don't live in a big city with all that's going on this year. How about you? Right? I mean, you know, how many of you want to live in Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City? It's a nice place to visit, but right now we're all no, no thank you, no thank you. Who would have ever thought the day would come when we wouldn't want to give up Hudson, Florida? <laughs> you know? I mean, nobody even knows where Hudson, Florida is. And I know there are people that still like the big city, but there's been so much turmoil and trouble in many of these cities and lockdowns and restrictions. Now, Thanksgiving's coming up. Have you heard of some of the restrictions? In some of these places where they're limiting the number of people that can come to your home for Thanksgiving in your own home. So I'm sort of glad that I live in a small town. But you know what? Paul might have bypassed Hudson. Paul might have traveled from Tallahassee to uh, any big places in between. Uh, to Tampa. To Miami. But there's more people. There's more people. And, 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 and therefore he has more of an opportunity to share the gospel with more people. And, and that then may result in those people, as we know Paul would charge people to then go out and spread the good news. So just it's logistically the common sense thing to do. And, and so that's probably why we see him simply passing through these two other towns on his way to Thessalonica, plus it was the normal trade route of his day. So he goes into the Jewish synagogue, it tells us, and as his custom was, so there, there's why, that's why I say this is his pattern, verse 2, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three days he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, there's three words that I, I want to emphasize here. Now, the first is the word reason. Again, this is the part of his methodology. So he goes to the, the bigger metropolitan areas. By the way, Hudson would be a big metropolitan area in Paul's day. It, I don't know if you realize this, the town of Nazareth. I got to visit Nazareth when I was in Israel. They say that in the times of Christ, Nazareth probably had about 300 occupants. The, the Jerusalem, if you go there, now how many have been to Jerusalem? You've been inside the walled city? You can walk from one side of the walled city to the other side of the walled city and what? If it wasn't for all the pedestrians, 30 minutes? Maybe less than that? It's not that big. I think it's 15, 15 square acres of or was originally, I forget the exact dimension, but, yeah, so all of these towns were small places compared to today. So don't say, well, I'm going to evangelize them. I shouldn't waste my time here in Hudson. I moved to Clearwater. Now, Hudson is a major, major, major metropolis compared to biblical days. So you're good right here. There's a lot of people here that need to know the Lord. Um, but that's what we see him doing. Going to major metropolitan areas, he's following the trade route, he goes into the synagogue, because there's going to be people there that believe in the Old Testament, he knows he's got some common ground with them, and the starting point, and the most important starting point. But then look at how he shares the truth with them. The first word that I want to point out is the word reason. The word reason, where it says, he reasoned with them from the scriptures at the end of verse 2. The word reason means to dialogue. He dialogued with them. In other words, Paul didn't just stand up in the synagogue and lecture. He didn't do what I'm doing today. He did more, more of what we do when we're in Sunday school, right? But how many of you uh, like Gary Gersol's Sunday school class? How many of you? Hate it? <laughs> <laughs> um, how many of you would like Sunday school to start back up? Okay, we're looking at doing that in January. We're hoping, hoping in January to start back up. Uh, Gary has said that he, he's ready to start. We're probably going to have this class out in the gym just because we're going to need more room. So we'll, we'll have the, the, the acoustics out there are very good, but we can look forward to sometime. Hopefully in January, uh, we'll start Sunday school back up. In Sunday school, we reason with each other. Right? Gary will ask us questions, and we'll talk about it. And it's back and forth dialogue. And that's what Paul was doing here. And, and that engages the listener. See, what I'm doing right now is just lecturing. And, and that's why so many people tend to nod off during church. Because <laughs> it's hard to stay engaged, right? Especially if you didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I mean, you're taking antihistamines because your sinuses are bothering you. And, and you're not know, sitting there, you're biting your tongue. And you're hoping that nobody sees your head nodding. Or your wife is elbowing you. And all of those other things that, all those things that we go through at church. Um, because... You're not engaged. Mentally, you try to be engaged, but if you're a little tired or if you've got some medical problems going on, it's hard to 
staying mentally engaged when somebody's just up there crying. certain times of the year, uh, Easter, I love to watch Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah. There is no better Ten Commandments movie than the one of Charlton Heston in it, and I love to watch that. Nostalgia, I guess, because as a kid I grew up watching it. And, and then Charlie Brown Christmas at Christmas time, so yeah, two, two classics. Oh, so first of all, in his sharing the gospel, he reasons with them, he dialogues with Secondly, there's another key word here, it says he explained. He explained the scriptures. And actually, that has the idea of opening, of opening the scriptures. Now, Paul did not have, like we have today, a book that looks like this, even a book of the Old Testament. The original manuscripts were written on, uh, usually on scrolls of value uh, or papyrus, either animal skins or a, form of, a, a crude form of paper. And oftentimes, they didn't have all of the Old Testament books. And they weren't divided the way they're divided today. And so you might go into the synagogue, they might not have, say, Jeremiah the prophet. They might not have, say, Isaiah the prophet. They might, they might not have the Torah. Depends on where the synagogue was, how affluent the synagogue was, and how many scribes had been in that area copying. And so they didn't have what we have today, but he would take them to whatever they had, apparently. And he would explain the scriptures to them. Now maybe, maybe he would do some of this simply verbally. But he would take them to the scriptures, take them to the scriptures, take them. And I say that because a lot of times we get caught up in witnessing people and we get off on maybe some sort of logical argument or something. And we leave the scriptures. Now sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes there's that pre-evangelistic work in the day and age in which we live where they, they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in God, they don't believe that Christ was the Son of God, etc., etc., etc. We may need to go off on some, some sort of apologetic argument to help them get to that point where we can then go to the Scriptures. But sometimes we just get sidetracked. And we get into those arguments of logic or other types of reasoning that are outside of the Scriptures, and we don't get back to the Scriptures. And what I see Paul doing is always going to the Scriptures. Always going to the Scriptures, because that's where the power of God is, in the Word of God. This is what brings life, right? That's what the Bible teaches. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And again, that we're born of incorruptible seed, not corruptible seed, by the living and enduring Word of God. As newborn babes, what? Desire the sincere milk of Rabbi Zacharias, that you may grow thereby. I love Rabbi Zacharias. I love his apologetics. But when you're talking to somebody, you've got to get back to the Word. Back to the Word. Back to the Word. That's what I see Paul doing here. Always going to the Word. I really do love Probably I know with the Lord enough, but I love to listen to that guy. You usually have to listen a couple of times, don't you, to, to really get everything that he's saying. God just blesses us with him. Some great men of God have gone on to be with the Lord. I'm looking to see what happens. I used to love to listen uh, to uh, um, Coral Ridge, the minister. Uh, boy, I think this took me to... Kennedy, thank you, Dr. D. James Kennedy. Um, really intelligent person. I got to go down and set through some of his evangelism explosion classes. And God used him in a wonderful way. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, Robbie Zacharias. I mean, the list goes on of, of these men of God who have gone home to be with the Lord. And I just look and see who's, who's going to rise up to take their place? Who's going to bring up to take their place? So, he reasons with them, he opens the scriptures to them. Thirdly, the third word I want you to look at is the word proving. Proving, again, in verse 3, explaining and proving. The word proving here literally means to lay down alongside. To lay down alongside, to prove by presenting the evidence. And so what I see from this then is that what Paul apparently does is he takes an Old Testament passage of scripture. And he, and he takes them to that passage of scripture, whether he does that simply through memory or whether he does it through one of the scrolls available in the synagogue, he shows them what it says about the Christ, and then he lays down alongside of that Jesus. So if it's talking about the suffering of Jesus, then he shows up, he tells them how Jesus suffered. If it's talking about the resurrection, that the Messiah, the Mashiach, would have to come back from the dead, then he would show them how Jesus came back from the dead. And so he constantly, he's laying down alongside Jesus with the Old Testament. Jesus with the Old Testament. 
Jesus with the Old Testament. And, and so we see him reasoning, that is dialogue, we see him taking up to the scripture, and then uh, showing by proving, laying down alongside the evidence that Christ is indeed the Messiah. 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 <laughs> Messiah in Hebrew, Messiah in English. I just put those two together. Right? We say Messiah, they say Messiah. And uh, Mashiach simply means the anointed one. Christ is the Greek translation of that. And so we say, we say Christ, but that's actually the way the Greeks would have pronounced it. Now, the Roman world was far less unified religiously than ancient Judaism was. But what's interesting here is we see in Acts chapter 17, verse 4, the response to Paul doing this. And, and note what the response is. It says, some of the Jews were persuaded. Now, notice it says only some. Once over there, again, there's still, you see that veil uh, of darkness over the eyes of the Jewish people. Only some of them respond. But look what, what it says after that. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did what? A large number. Now, what does that mean? A large number. Right? A large number. Lots of people. A large number of God fearing Greeks. And not a few prominent women. What is a God-fearing Greek? A God-fearing Greek in ancient Rome would have been those people who had embraced Yahweh, who were maybe considering becoming converts to Judaism, or had just come to the uh, somehow the conclusion that Yahweh was the one true God, as opposed to the pantheon of gods in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And those of you that have been to Greece, I mentioned this before. Man, there's temples all over the place. Every you name it, they had they had a god. Right? And, and what gods they didn't have, they brought in from other places. We know that in the Roman times, that's uh, mystery religions from the East. But mystery religions and cults like the, the uh, Eleusinian, the Dionysian, uh, the great mother cult of Sybil, the Egyptian cult of, of Isis and Osiris. All of these mystery religions were coming in from the East into the, the Greek territories there where Paul is ministering. Uh, because of some of the things that they offered, uh, that the, the old, stale, ritualistic religions of the Greeks and Romans did not offer. And it was, there was a mystery to it. There was an intimacy, a secretness to it. There was also a lot of sexual <coughs> indulgence in these mystery religions, which appealed to the carnal nature of um, not just the ancient Greeks and Romans, but uh, to people throughout time. And so they had all of these different religions, but the God-fearing Greeks that we read about here in chapter 17 would have been those who were probably worshiping in the synagogue with the Jews and had embraced again uh, Yahweh as being the one true God. And then it says as well, not, uh, and not a few prominent women. We see that over and over again. We see a lot of women responding to the Gospels, uh, responding to the Gospel in uh, the Scriptures. We, we saw it in Philippi, back the first person the first person we see responding to the gospel in the city of Philippi was Lydia. And so, you know, Christ is interested in all people, all genders, all nationalities, everybody. And our witness ought to be to everybody. Now, that leads us then to, so we see a little bit of his methodology, just real quick. But then what I want to do is note what he did as he shares with them about the Christ. He, he talks about four different things. First of all, he talks about the Christ, right? Explaining and proving the Christ. So you have to understand what that concept is. Does the Old Testament teach about the Christ, the Mashiach, the anointed one? We say, well, of course it does. Well, what passages do? Now, I want to look briefly, really, really quickly at a few passages that do. Secondly, about the fact that the Christ had to suffer. So he not only points out that there is a Christ that will be coming, but there will be a Christ that would come and suffer. Thirdly, that that Christ would rise from the dead. Fourthly, that the person who was that Christ then was Jesus of Nazareth. He was the Christ. So, in your bulletins, you have a handout. And it has verses on it. It looks like this. Well, actually, you'll just have the address. You can stick that in the back of your Bible. So I would encourage you to use that. Remember, all of these passages, here's an amazing fact, all of these passages that you have on a handout are written anywhere from 500 years to almost 2,000 years, if you go back to Genesis 3.15, to almost 2,000 years before Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled all of them. How many did he fulfill? By conservative estimates, different scholars, Alfred and Ed Edershine and others that give different amounts, by conservative estimates, probably about 300 prophecies. Because some of the prophecies deal with the same thing. 
300 prophecies. What are the odds of one man fulfilling, at, at bare minimum, 500 years later, 300 prophecies? It's a, a prophecy is an amazing aspect of the Bible that lends itself to the credibility of the Bible. It helps to validate it, if you will. It doesn't prove it, and it's not that it is the Word of God, but it helps validate it in our minds that, okay, this is of supernatural origin. Only God can foretell, foretell the future. So, first of all, let's look at the idea that the scriptures teach that there will be a coming Christ. Genesis 49 10 says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes, to whom it belongs. And the obedience of the nations is this. No, it doesn't just say Israel. It, just, it doesn't say nation singular, it says nations. So, there will be this ruler that the scepter, the ruling staff, rightly belongs to, and he will, the obedience of the nation will be that he will rule over. All nations. That doesn't say all but the nations. So this implies a coming anointed one, a coming Mashiach. Isaiah 7 14 is another passage. It says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Now it doesn't say Mashiach here, or anointed one, Christ. It says Emmanuel. But I think we can all agree that Emmanuel is a very unique name, and a virgin giving birth is a very unique circumstance for the birth of a child. We all recognize that the New Testament says that this was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. But even if they don't agree with that, certainly this is speaking of some very, very, very unique individual that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God, God with us. You don't just call him anybody, right? Micah 5 2. Micah 5 2 goes on to talk more about the Mashiach. It says that you, Bethlehem, and Picard, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come. For me, one who will be ruler, the anointed one, ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So Micah says there will be a coming Mashiach, a coming ruler, a coming Messiah. Daniel chapter 7, very significant passage, verses 13 through 15. This one certainly, this, this is no ordinary human being. This is not David. This is not Solomon. This is not any of the other kings of Israel or of Judah. Listen to what it says about this coming ruler. Daniel 7, 13, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. David didn't do that. Solomon didn't do that. None of the kings of Israel did do that. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. So he goes to the very throne of God, goes into the presence of God. Verse 14, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Okay, so we have a ruler who's coming who can approach the very throne of God, and God gives to him all this the glory and the power and the authority, and he, he, uh, every nation, all people, every nation of every language worships him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. So, again, pointing to a very unique Mashiach, Messiah, anointed one, a king, a ruler uh, that will come in the future. Now, Jewish people, we show them this, will oftentimes say, well, this proves to me that Jesus wasn't that guy. Because Jesus isn't ruling and reigning right now on earth. All the nations of the earth are paying him homage. Where is Jesus? But they miss the fact that there are two comings of the Messiah in Scripture. In fact, the very next passage that we see implies that. There is a first coming, Jesus born in Bethlehem, and there is a second coming when he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his feet touched on the models. There's a great earthquake according to Zechariah chapter 12, and the mountain splits in two, and every eye will see him. The look on the one whom they have pierced. Daniel chapter 9 indicates that there will be something that will happen in between those two comings. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, a very significant Old Testament passage often attacked by liberals, because of, in fact, the book of Daniel often attacked, well defended by others as well. But in Daniel chapter 9, it says, Seventy sevens are decreed for your people, and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision, and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. No one understand this, from the issue of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the Mashiach, the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens, and sixty-two sevens, it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench of the times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, note this, the anointed one, that is the Mashiach, the anointed one will be cut off. Same phrase used throughout the Torah 
of the death penalty. Cut off. A person who sinned uh, and violated one of the laws of Moses was said to be cut off from among his people. The anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Well, how can that happen? And we just read in Daniel chapter 7 that he's going to be given glory and sovereign power and authority and all peoples and nations and men of every language will worship him. See, there has to be two comings. There has to be. The first one where he comes and he dies as an atonement for our sin, where he's cut off from among his people. And the second where he comes as a ruler to reign over all the earth. After the 62 sons, verse 26, a very important verse, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Isaiah, another passage. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. We're all aware of this. is one of those verses we quote at Christmas time. For unto us the child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, so he's a Mashiach, so the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it for justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Forever. So we have a coming machine. We have a Christ. The Bible clearly talks about that. Paul starts with that, with this Christ. Jeremiah chapter 25, or chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called Jehovah Tisfanu, the Lord, our righteousness. So he starts with that, right? He explains and proves that Christ, he starts with Christ, that also now had to suffer. So is there a suffering Messiah in the Old Testament? Well, you, you and I can all say very quickly, yeah, of course there is, because we know the passages that are listed on there again. Let me just zip through them real quick. Genesis 3.15. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. 2,000 years before Jesus, it was predicted that there would be a death blow to the seed of the uh, serpent, and, and some sort of heel strike to the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman being Jesus. We know that from uh, the New Testament, but there are even clearer passages talking about a suffering Messiah. Isaiah 53, 3. Keep up with it. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men. Now, Jewish people today will say Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel as a nation, but Israel is referred to earlier in Jeremiah as the suffering servant. And it is. It is. But as you go through Isaiah 53, what you'll find out is that it goes from the, the nation of Israel to an individual. And we find that in the pronouns that are used, where it says he, 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 he. And, and as you look at the descriptions of what he will do, it's not something a nation can do. It's only something some special person could do, who could atone for sins, who could bear our iniquities, who could suffer in our place. And so we see it moving from the nation of Israel to the Mashiach, Messiah, uh, to Jesus, and that he would suffer. Isaiah 53, uh, verses 7 through 11. He was oppressed and afflicted. Verse 8, uh, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. The end of verse 8, for he was cut off. There's that phrase again, cut off from the land of the living. He had to die. The Messiah, according to Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus ever came into this world, it was predicted he would have to die. Why did he have to die? It goes on, for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And remember, the death of the Messiah, the death of the Mashiach. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence towards any deceit in his mouth, but it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Well, how would that happen if he dies? The Mashiach will see his offspring and his days will be gone. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He comes back to life. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will just by any man is dead. Yes, he can. Because he's alive. And he will bear their enemies. You've got a suffering, a suffering Mashiach, a suffering Messiah. Psalm 22, verse 1, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you read the rest of Psalm 22, you see uh, all the suffering that the Shia uh, would go through. 
So we have a Christ that the Bible is looking forward to. That Christ had to die, had to suffer, and then had to rise from the dead. That's the third point that Paul makes with these Jewish uh, people. And we see that again in the various scriptures. Isaiah 53, verse 11. It says, after the suffering of the soul, we just read this, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify me. So he's cut off, but he comes back. He's cut off, but he's coming back. He was cut off almost 2,000 years ago. He's coming back when? We don't know. <laughs> soon. Sora, Fortune, Sora in Russia, right? But soon and very soon. And, uh, anyways, he'll be, he'll be coming back. Psalm chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will run, rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor will you let your Holy One see the gate. Come back. You won't be abandoned to the grave. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Very significant passage. And I will pour out on the house of David. This is Jehovah God speaking. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. In the text, if you look at the context. Jehovah, the personal name of God. God is speaking here. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me. Who's me? In the text. Who's me? Jehovah. They will look on Jehovah, the one they have what? Pierced. When was Jehovah pierced? When was God pierced? And his and son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the deity of Christ. We have the deity of the Messiah here. We have the deity of Christ here. And we see him being pierced. They will look on me, which means what? How are they going to look on him? He's dead. He's in the grave. How are all the Jewish people, how are all the inhabitants of earth, according to Zechariah, are going to see the pierced Messiah? Because he's alive. He's alive. There had to be a resurrection. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for our only child. <clears throat> and so we have the coming of Christ predicted in the Old Testament. We have the fact that the coming of Christ would suffer in the Old Testament. We have the fact that the Christ would rise from the dead in the Old Testament. And then finally, Paul then lays down alongside of that. Right? The proving. Lays down alongside that Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. Jewish people sometimes say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be Christ. Other people said he was Christ, but Jesus never claimed to be Christ. That's false. If you ever hear somebody say that, that's false. Let me give you three passages. Three passages that I prove down shallow about that, that Jesus did claim to be the Christ by his answers in these passages. Matthew 16, Matthew 16, 15 through 20. But what about you, Jesus asked, says he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, right? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by, by my father in heaven. No, he did not say, Peter, 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 Simon, 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 you're always getting it wrong. You know, I'm not a Baptist, I'm not. You thought I was alive, but I'm not. You thought I was a Christ, I'm not. Is that what he did? No, he says, he says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father. Let me ask you a question. Does God lie? No, so this was revealed by God. Jesus is the Christ. As Simon said, he was the Christ. And Jesus is accepting that for himself. He, he's saying, basically, you're right, Simon, and it is God who has revealed that to you. I think that's pretty conclusive that Jesus believed that he was the Christ and claimed that for himself. But there are other passages. Luke 20, 24, verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Well, what did we just read about? About the Mashiach, the Mashiach, the Mashiach, the Mashiach. He cut off the Mashiach, he suffered the Mashiach. That's what he's talking about. So while he doesn't use the word Mashiach here, he's implying, he says, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Finally, one of the most conclusive verses, Mark chapter 14, verses 60 through 62. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked, Are you the Christ, 
the son of the blessed one. Look at verse 62. What does Jesus say? I am. I think that's pretty clear. What about you? <laughs> I am. By the way, that's ego in me in the Greek. This may go very well be a reference to what when God, when Moses said, Who shall say to me? And, and God says, All that I am, that I am, has sent you. He's a, not only, I think, he's answered them, Yes, I am the Christ, but it's even more than that. He's the second person of the Almighty God. I am, said Jesus, and you, look at what he says now. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Did Jesus ever claim to be the Christ? This is exactly what Zechariah is talking about. For the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. This is what Daniel chapter 7 is talking about. For the, for the Son of Man being given authority, coming with that authority to rule and reign over them. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus suffered for our sins. Jesus rose again. And Jesus offers to all who will believe in him eternal life. Amen. Amazing prophecy. We've only looked at a few. He said, we've looked at an awful lot, Pastor Dean. I didn't hear that. It's quarter after. <laughs> <laughs> My stomach's wrong. I got an Applebee's coupon. <laughs> amazing. This stuff is amazing. You go through the book, there is no other religious holy book in the world that has the prophecies that the Bible has that have been fulfilled to the, in detail about such an individual. Amazing studies. I listed some websites there that you can look up at the bottom of your, of your um, handout there as well as in the bulletin. I hope that this proves helpful as we, as we look at how Paul reached out uh, to the world around him and we seek to do the same with the gospel of Jesus Christ, winning people to Jesus and helping them to become disciples. Let's pray. And we're just going to close with this prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for your holy word, that you've preserved it throughout time, and that we have such ease of access to it. And we can read about these prophecies written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years before Jesus. And yet we see in all of them Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. Help us, help us like Paul to be faithful witnesses yes. to people who need to know him. I pray that if there's anybody here that doesn't know Christ personally, that they would realize that he died on the cross for their sins. He bore the righteous wrath of a holy God, satisfying that holy God through his death on the cross for our sins so that we can have eternal life. And all we can do now, let's put our faith and trust in Him. If somebody here hasn't believed, Lord, I pray that you would help them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, even now, and be saved. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of the blessings that we've heard about today, people that showed up yesterday, all the shoeboxes that were packed. We pray for the kids who receive these shoeboxes, that they will come to know Jesus as their Savior, and maybe even their parents and relatives. Father, bless that wonderful ministry. Bless us as we seek to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet someone before you leave today. God bless you. Have a wonderful remainder of this Lord's day.